Not, they have decided not to brave the cold weather. So if I can get one of you gentlemen to pull those doors, we'll have sanctuary, and we will come together as a class. Thank God for good hot tea. Praise the Lord. Cheers. And the fresh coffee that was coffee. All right. Let's pray together tonight. Father, thank you for this night's service. <clears throat> thank you. I'm especially thankful tonight that on this night, Margaret Robinson is bringing her son Brad home. Amen. We're thankful for that, Lord. Thank you, sir. For... <coughs> Healing comes only from you. And we rejoice over this blessing that we have. I ask you to fulfill the completion of that boy's healing. I call him a boy. I know he's a 39-year-old man, but to him, to me, I've seen him since he was a boy, and like my own boys, I think they're never grown. They're always going to be kids. So we thank you for him. Thank you for arresting his attention concerning whatever he needs to keep his blood pressure down, and this will never be visited again. So tonight, sir, we thank you for uh, uh, our discussions for the evening and the purpose in the discussions. And we'll learn from you and learn who you are. In fact, I believe the scripture says that no one single generation can comprehend you. It takes multiple generations to get a handle as to who you are. And so we thank you for that. And we're part of it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the reason I said that to you is because tonight I want you to know that what is of, of the things that Jesus is called, what is he the prince of? known as the Prince of Peace. He does not want a war. He will put off war as long as possible, but you press him against his people. And like he said to, to Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus when he knocked him on his rear end, and he was blinded, and said, Lord, who are you? He said, I am Jesus whom you persecute. That's he, in, in, he introduced himself to him just like that. He was hurting the people, not Jesus. But the people and Jesus are one and the same as far as God's concerned. You hurt my people, you hurt me. I am Jesus whom you persecute. This is what he said to him. He introduced himself to him personally. I am Jesus whom you persecute. There he was, knocked on his backside, blinded. Now that's who he is. The Prince of Peace will become the man of war when you hurt his people. So this week when we were in the minister's conference, I met a man from Pakistan who invited me to his country. Wants me to come in September. With everything in me that doesn't want to go, I'm making it a matter of prayer. Just to see if perhaps the Lord wants me to go. Pakistan? Uh, this is a whole other country. <laughs> isn't, that what, isn't that what Forrest Gump said? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd have to have a, I'm not going to put out a fleece. I'm just waiting on his leading inside my belly. If I get this gut leading here, we'll, we may do something. But until then, as long as he's quiet and saying nothing, I may just be quiet and say nothing. But you can imagine a trip to Pakistan would be spooky, don't you think? I'd have to work on eradicating fear before I left, before I went into Pakistani airspace. But tonight, what, because of that, this particular man, that, this pastor I was telling you about, I asked him what happened to, as far as he knew, the compound where Osama bin Laden was extracted. 
And he said it was still owned by the government and that uh, it was in lockdown. But he wanted it for a women's center and a Christian ministry where women and children could be protected, taken care of, because women are abused in those countries by extremists. Well, because of that and thinking about that compound, I, re I remember the night that the news broadcast hit Osama bin Laden had been, had been eradicated. And President Obama came on television and told us that, that, he, that the SEAL teams had gone in and found him, got him. We have confirmed it is him. And man, I shouted. It was about, I don't know, 11 or 12 o'clock at night. I shouted and I called James Bullard immediately, my <coughs> lieutenant colonel. I said, he answered the phone, and he, I knew I woke him up. I said, they got him. He said, what? I said, they got him. They got Osama bin Laden. And he and I just rejoiced over the telephone. The next, I called Rico Fanagrossi, the uh, former uh, Marine Master Sergeant that had been in church with me for quite a number of years. He answered, he was awake, and I said, they got him. He said, who? I said, bin Laden. He said, hold on. Turn on the television. Man, we rejoiced over the, over the phone. See, that man, Bin Laden, touched my family insofar as a man that my brother went to high school with was killed in the Trade Towers. Right here in Georgia. A man that went to high school with my brother, Ken McBrayer, died that day when those buildings fell to the ground. So I had a personal interest in seeing justice taken place, personally. In the process of time, after that 9-11 incident, the first responders that were sent there, I had a man that bought a, a Buick. I had bought an old 51 Buick and sold it to a man out in uh, Denver, Colorado. His name was Shane Milosevic. Shane's brother was one of the ones that was called in as a first responder, and because of the uh, toxic waste and the toxic materials that were there, he got lung cancer and died quickly, the direct result of what he had breathed in at ground zero. So my friend Shane's brother, I, he was my next phone call. I called Shane. I said, your brother's enemy has been brought to justice, and he called me. He just shouted over the telephone with me from Denver. So tonight, I have to tell you that uh, I didn't have a lot of faith in the military for a lot of years. I was raised up, my dad was World War II and didn't really come, of course, hearing him tell stories all my childhood didn't mean a lot to me. I just knew it was something in his history. And then I remember my brother <clears throat> receiving his letter from the uh, President of the United States saying greetings. Uh, you're being drafted in the United States military and you have various choices, whatever, and you call this particular field office in Fort McPherson and go from there. Well, my mom started to cry because she remembered the day when my dad was drafted at 25 years old with three children, a three-year-old, a two-year-old, and a nine-month-old. And my dad went overseas to the South Pacific was on four assault waves, Guam, Peleliu, Saipan, Mariana Island groups, the uh, Tinian. He was on he was on Tinian the morning that the sh that the Enola Gay took off, dropping the, the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. My dad told me that. In the spring of that year, he left in January. In the spring of that year, they got word that President Roosevelt was dead. He said, now there we were out in the middle of God-forsaken nowhere. Didn't know where in God's name we were. Vast ocean all the way around you. You're out, the only man that can get any hopes of getting you home is now dead. He said, he and all those boys all started crying. 
18, 19, 20-year-old boy. His dad said, I was the old man of the bunch. I was 25. He said, all you, you just had to get up and take your orders. Probably not going to go home. He'd already seen a lot of boys killed. Mama worried herself sick from 1941 to 1945, thinking Dad was going to get drafted every day. And they managed to stay just ahead of it with the birth of every child because they would draft 18, 19 year olds and then 18, 19 year olds with one child, and then 8, 19, 20 year olds, and then 20 year olds with one child, and 20 year olds with two children, and then 21 year olds, and 21 with two, two children, and then 23 year olds. Finally, they got to dad 25 and three children, and he got drafted. The reason he was drafted is because of a. It was President Franklin Roosevelt's intention for a full ground assault on the nation of Japan. Early estimates were that we would lose a million men in our army on that ground assault. That's what they were planning. We, of course, they didn't know it until after they got home because they don't tell you what the plans are. They just put you in. And well, Dad said that uh, the very thing that he thought, he said, if, if Roosevelt doesn't die, they don't change their strategy because the, the atomic bomb had been developed. Oppenheimer and the, uh, the Manhattan Project, as they called it, had been developed. But... Roosevelt hesitated to use it. But after he died, that was so secret. The Manhattan Project was so secretive, even the vice president of the United States didn't know about it. So when they briefed him, a man that had been on the battlefield in World War I knew what it was going to be like to lose a million men in battle and refused to do that. He said, that's suicide. So he ordered that bomb to be dropped no earlier than August the 2nd. They leafleted the city, telling the people to get out. We have something, we're going to destroy the city. He had, um, <clears throat> it was the, uh, the commander that uh, replaced Yamamoto. If, if my history is correct, if James were here, he could fact check me. Perhaps he will. Maybe he's watching. And uh, he... Uh, they warned the Japanese that we have a bomb that can take the entire city. We're going to take the entire city out. Well, they did, he's now unconditionally surrender. They did not. They dropped the bomb, destroyed the entire city, killing hundreds of thousands. Then Truman, President Truman, that replaced Roosevelt, said and at the direction of uh, uh, the architect, Gen General Curtis LeMay, go now to Hiroshima, to Nagasaki. They leave, they did that city. Get out. Now, some of the people started leaving that city, so it wasn't near the carnage that the first city was. They had the first city to prove that they could do this. We'll drop it again. Unconditionally surrender. They did not. Drop the bomb. Destroyed the city. Truman then went and got me a message to Hirohito, the emperor of Japan, we're going to Tokyo. We're going to take it out now, too. And if you do not now completely surrender unconditionally, you will experience a rain of fire out of heaven, the likes of which has never been seen on this earth. He called his bluff because that was the last bomb we had. We only had three. But he didn't know that. So they unconditionally surrendered. And on the USS Missouri, it was signed. It was uh, General uh, MacArthur. They had all the nations there, all the representatives of the nations, and they all signed the, the treaty, and they all uh, signed the surrender. I visited the, United, the USS Missouri. It's, on, uh, it's docked at Pearl Harbor now. And it's three football fields long. The great guns are on it. You remember in the, in the uh, uh, it was built in 1944. It was the last destroyer built, last battleship built. Remember um, when the Gulf War broke out in 1991? Remember they were showing uh, scenes of this big ship with big guns shooting towards 
out of the Gulf, uh, out of, um, what's that Gulf over there? In, um, uh, right there at Iraq and Iran, uh, Persian Gulf. And that ship that was shooting those 16-inch uh, gigantic bullets was uh, the USS Missouri. After World War II and after the Korean War, it was put on mothballs and was parked from 1955 until 1980. And Ronald Reagan had a dream of a 600-ship Navy. He believed in peace through strength. And among the other ships, Reagan ordered the mighty Mo pulled out of, out of mothballs and be refitted and brought up to speed, air conditioned, new computer systems with comforts that it had never had before and launched it again. And it was used through the Gulf War. And now it's, it's, a, it's now a museum. And uh, it was a fascinating thing to go through that ship. Go into the area where the men slept. You could still smell the, the body odors of the men that had been there. You could see all the old computer stuff. I mean, these dinosaur computers of the 80s are still in there. And, and the mess hall. And, and, the, uh, and, of course, then there's the, uh, the officer's mess, the nice place with the mahogany uh, uh, paneling on the walls and all that. Well, I said all that just to give you an idea of the greatness of the United States military. But I did, still didn't have a lot of uh, respect or any trust in our military because my, my remembrance coming up was of Vietnam. And my other brother, Grady, Grady was uh, drafted. And he went to Vietnam. And boy, I remember Mama crying. I remember her worried about Butch. He, he was, uh, his, his unit was activated twice for Vietnam, but he was called out during the race riots of the 60s in Atlanta, in Alabama. And uh, uh, I just remember mom's worry, her tears, and every day that Grady would send a, a letter home with that uh, red, white, and blue border all the way around it, upper, upper right-hand corner, right free, where they, they'd, they'd mail the letters for free. Every time we get a letter, we'd be thrilled, but that letter was already a week old, so we didn't know if he had died the week before, see? So we never really could get any peace. But every night, Walter Cronkite would talk about 12 American soldiers killed, 145 uh, Viet Cong killed. He would always, it was always one-sided, but, you know, we didn't win that war. We went away from there in a stalemate. I didn't have any, I didn't think that war could be won. And if I didn't think war could be won then, I was absolutely convinced that it was a absolute no, it was a complete futility to do anything militarily. When in 1980, I was driving up uh, Fulton Industrial Boulevard, just as I was turning right on Bankhead to get to the expressway to go to the warehouse where I was working, a press conference was called and President Carter came on and said that an attempt was made to free the 52 American hostages in Iran. And the six helicopters that were sent all flew in together and ran into each other, and their engines were full of sand, and they de it destroyed them, killed everybody on board. And now they, the, the plans were being made for the Iranians to separate all the hostages instead of having them together. And so all that was just futile. Just nothing worked. Military didn't work. I had no faith in it whatsoever until Reagan came on board. And he spent a trillion dollars rebuilding the military. And when he did, when the Gulf War broke out, I remember I was right over here working for a house that Brother Pruitt had just bought. I was still painting and doing wallpaper. I was inside painting that house for him, a rental that he had bought. When on the radio it said, this end on CNN News, it got quiet. The Gulf War had broken out, and the bombs were dropping. You could hear it. They were, And I dropped to my knees in that house. I said, God, save our boys. Help our nation. We'd had some friends that died in Vietnam. 
we knew people that had died in Vietnam. We knew parents of children had died in Vietnam. And the most heartbreaking thing you'd ever experience was to see a shiny military vehicle pull up and a very well-dressed man in dress greens or dress blues come walking up the house and knock on the door to say, we regret to inform you that your son was killed in action. Believe me, you didn't want to hear that. And we knew it. We knew it could happen. But here we were again. And the bombs were dropping. And when I found out the kind of smart bombs, when the you could see it from above, and they would ask, sir, do you want the you want the laser guided bomb to go in the men's or ladies' restroom? And they could pinpoint accuracy, it wasn't carpet bombing, and they could destroy and in this. And I mean, what how long did the Gulf War last? Desert Shield and then Desert Storm, just a matter of days. And the war to end all wars, as, as uh, uh, Saddam Hussein said, the mother of all battles was going to break. The elite Republican guard was going to take care of, and he spread his propaganda to his people. Well, we handed the elite Republican guard their rear ends in just a few days. It was over. They were coming down on their knees begging. The boys were young boys, the Iraqi soldiers were begging our 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 boys not to hurt them. And I remember watching our <laughs> I remember watching our guys, just a highly trained killing machine soldier, say, get on your knees, speaking to him in, in uh, uh, what was what is their language? Arabic. Arabic, speaking to him, you're okay now, you're okay. And they're begging and, and thanking the soldiers as they're as they're uh, surrendering in mass. We handed it to them, son. Th suddenly, my idea of military and uh, military armament, the United States military might, was different because we had a commander-in-chief that believed in peace through strength. You become so strong. He said in his uh, inaugural address, among other things that he said, there have been four major wars in my lifetime. Not one of them was because, caused because America was too strong. He said, we need to be strong. When you're a strong entity, when you're a strong fighting force, your enemies are much less likely to want to wage war against you. It made sense to me. It was the first time I saw the A-10 Warthog, that, in, that uh, jet that had the big jet engines on each side, but it looked like a little, looked like a little balsa wood airplane. <laughs> And with the big jet, and it could fly down low and drop those little carpet bombs on and destroy all the runways of the enemy's uh, 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 runways so they, can't, they couldn't take off with their airplanes. And watch that thing turn, cut sharp, and those, watch those uh, F 15s, F 16s, uh, F 14 uh, Tomcats fly off the top of the, the decks and dual flame go out and drop the bombs and come back. And I remember watching Colin Powell. Listen to one of his boys after he landed and came back, and they asked him, was your, your bombing raid successful? He said, today I'm proud to be a United States Air Force pilot. Today I'm proud to be an American. When he said that, you could see Colin Powell breaking tears. And you just see the greatness of, the, of the, the men that decided. He said, the sooner we get this war over with, the better off we'll all be, but it's got to be completely cruel until it's over. Well, my idea of the military had changed. <clears throat> Just another thing to underscore that we had voted in the right man in 1980. Did you know that our military was so decimated that right after Reagan took office, he brought in the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Commandant of the Marine Corps and said, there's a new sheriff in town. We're going to we're going to give all the guys a raise, and we're going to build up this military, and we're going to take care of this. Right after that, Flight 847. Remember Robert Steedham was a Navy um, officer that was taken, that, uh, that plane was taken by terrorists, and they killed him and threw him off the plane onto the tarmac just to send a message to, to America that, as to who they were and, and uh Reagan ordered that plane to be taken. And the commandant said, sir, we can't take it. We don't have the weaponry to take it. And one airplane. 
We didn't have the weaponry. You see why Jimmy Carter was one of the lamest presidents we've ever had? I love him. And when P.X. Kelly told him that, Reagan said to him, you should have told me that on day one. You should have told me that my Marine Corps was not able. For this reason, you'll finish out your term, but you will resign immediately thereafter. He ordered his resignation at the end of his term. Retired him from the United States Marine Corps. We had a new sheriff in town. One that was going to take care of America. One that was going to... What is, what is the president's number one purpose as commander-in-chief? Protect the people of the United States of America. Right now, we've got an invasion coming up from the South. Everything from prisons released and... and Inmates from foreign countries crossing our border with everything from fentanyl to, to trafficking to crime like you wouldn't believe. Well, we have a man that has pledged to lock the border, lock it down completely, and have the most massive deportation that's ever been in the history of the United States of America to protect the people. We're worth protecting. Well, I said all that to say this. <clears throat> the Prince of Peace will become the man of war. So I want to read to you tonight the play-by-play, -play, the moment-by-moment -moment account of what happened the night Osama bin Laden was extracted from that compound. I think you'll have the same pride in our United States military when you hear this that I have. So do we have time for about a half hour of reading, and then we'll uh, see what time we have left in the next hour? Okay. Listen carefully. The Prince of Peace will become the man of war. I love our military. I love our boys willing to put their lives on the line. We were at the airport the other day, and I looked, and there was a man that had a cap on that said Bronze Star. Handsome black guy. I walked up to him. Fist bumped him, and that, that just didn't seem to do it. I just had to hug him. <laughs> you, just, you remember two strangers there were just hugging him right there in the middle of the Dallas-Fort Worth airport. And I had my, I, and found out later he was going to fly on my plane, but I put my mouth up next to his ear, and I said, "Soldier, thank you. I stayed home while you were doing that. You put your life on the line so that I could live free, so that I could enjoy my life. Well done, soldier. Welcome home." He just hugged me, and then the other people who came up and saw him saw his stripes. And, they come up and hugged him. People, different ones coming up right there as we're standing at the gate. America. Land of the free. Home of the brave. I'll never forget this night. I was also asleep as this was taking place. <clears throat> May 2nd, 2011. Abbottabad, Pakistan. 12.45 a.m. The man with 30 minutes to live sleeps in his beige pajamas. Meanwhile, two U.S. Army UH-60 Black Hawk helicopters fly low over Pakistani airspace. The moon is a waning crescent. Hack, the helicopter aircraft commander, is up front in the left seat, his co-pilot to the right. Chalk 1, as the lead bird is known, carries a dozen Navy SEALs on the hard metal metal floor of the, cab of the cabin space is a dozen Navy SEALs and behind it, oh my goodness, my eyes are, let me get my tears out of my eyes so I can read this to you. <laughs> Thank you. He says here, uh, he carries a dozen, a dozen Navy SEALs on the hard metal floor in the cabin space behind the cockpit. 
Chalk Two Fairies Tin Seals, a Pakistani American CIA translator, and a six year old Belgian Malinois dog named Cairo. Like the soldiers, Cairo wears Kevlar body armor and specially fitted night vision goggles. <laughs> the fuselage of each bird is painted black. Special metallurgy and heat suppressing exhaust systems minimize the 60s radar profile. Noise reducing technology affixed to the tips of the rotors dampens the sound. The pilots enhance their aircraft's invisibility by using a flying technique known as nap of the earth, hugging the landscape contours as low to the ground as possible. The fully laden machines travel at a deliberate 75 miles per hour. Death is coming in the darkness. Each member of this special team of SEAL, Sea, Air, and Land commandos remains almost motionless on the floor. The 60s are equipped with crew seats, but it is a matter of pride that SEALs are too tough for such luxury. Many are asleep despite this dangerous mission. Their uniform consists of cry-precision desert digital camouflage combat pants with a matching pullover shirt designed to be worn under body armor. Pockets along each pant leg contain gear vital to the mission, leather gloves, medical kit, energy bars, extra ammunition. In case the mission goes wrong, every SEAL carries a few hundred dollars in American currency to buy local assistance and find a way out of Pakistan. The fighters are Navy, but the pilots are Army. This is by design. The 60 is flown by both branches of the military, but it is widely acknowledged that the Army pilots are best in infill and exfill, infiltration, exfiltration. The dangerous business of landing a helicopter in a battle zone and successfully departing when the mission is over. Tonight, infill and exfill are life and death. Both Blackhawks took off 60 minutes ago from a secure airfield in Halalabad, Afghanistan. In support, two larger CH-47 Chinook helicopters flew out 15 minutes later loaded with spare fuel for the return journey. The two bathtubs, as the Chinooks are nicknamed for their elongated shape, will land at a secret base in Afghanistan close to the Pakistani border, there to await further orders. The SEALs are headed toward a private compound near the town of Abbottabad, just under 200 miles away. Locals call it the Waziristan Palace for its enormous size. Located on Cap... Kakul Road in a middle-class section of Abbottabad known as Bilal Town. The acre-sized facility is surrounded by thick walls ranging in height from 10 to 18 feet tall. Solid steel gates cover each entrance. Several structures are a large open and a large open courtyard for raising animals and growing vegetables fill the space inside. The plan is for Chalk 1 to hover low over the courtyard. Seals on board will invade the compound by sliding down a system of thick ropes attached to a strong point inside the helicopter, known as the FRIES, Fast Rope Insertion Extraction System. Fast roping greatly resembles a fire pole descent, thus the leather gloves each man carries. Once on the ground, they will spread out and begin their search for tonight's target. Meanwhile, Chalk 2 will land just outside the compound walls. Cairo, the dog, his SEAL handler, Will Chesney, the CIA interpreter, and a small sniper team will disembark to provide perimeter security. They will seek out any approaching force or anyone trying to escape. One squad of SEALs will remain on board Chalk 2 at this time, then be flown into the compound where they will fast rope onto the flat top roof to the three-story main house. Unloaded, both helicopters will then fly to a designated location to await the order to return and pick up the combatants. Total time on the ground will be no more than 40 minutes. There are several buildings to infiltrate, but the main house is of greatest interest. It is thought that the pacer, as the tall figure whom satellite cameras so often photograph strolling the grounds is called, lives in this structure. The SEALs will enter the residence seeking this man. If he chooses to come along peacefully, he will be bound and escorted into a helicopter for a flight to captivity. Should he, the homeowner, prefer to fight, he'll be shot dead. 
The weapon of choice for these seals varies by man, whether it be the Heckler and Koch HK416 assault rifle, FN Mark 48 machine gun, or the H&K MP7 machine pistol that fires an armor-piercing cartridge. In addition, each man wears a holstered pistol, and no seal is ever comfortable unless he's carrying a very long, very sharp fixed blade knife. The target on this warm, humid night is the notorious killer Osama bin Laden, the 54-year-old terrorist mastermind of the 9-11 attacks on New York and Washington, D.C. Formerly named Osama bin Mohammed bin Awad bin Laden, he is six foot five with a long gray and black beard. Saudi Arabian by birth, the terrorist was born the son of a billionaire who died in a plane crash when Osama was just 10 years old. In a footnote, it says the father, Mohammed bin Awad bin Laden, was the wealthiest non-royal person in Saudi Arabia. He made his billions in construction as the official royal builder of Saudi Arabia, running an, or, an organization now known as the Saudi bin Laden Group. He fathered 52 children by his 22 wives. Osama bin Laden inherited $30 million of his father's $5 billion fortune. Bin Laden is known to be frugal and soft-spoken, but a strict father to the estimated 26 children he's fathered with his many wives. The terrorist is the most wanted man in the world. People everywhere know his face. There's nowhere he can go without being recognized. Raised in a world of privilege, He's driven by a deep hatred for America. Bin Laden has turned his back on the peaceful tenets of the Muslim religion, preferring to live a life dedicated to killing U.S. citizens. This has come at a cost. He spends his life on the run, taking extreme cautions to avoid being apprehended. But even from this remote hideaway, Bin Laden controls a vast terror network. Extremely, extremists rally to his cause. And his message of hate does not fall on deaf ears in the world of the jihadi. Most of all, bin Laden is a murderer. In addition to the almost 3,000 innocent people killed on 9-11, he has used his considerable wealth to lead the terrorist organization Al-Qaeda, or known as the Foundation, in numerous deadly attacks around the world since 1998. In August 1996, bin Laden declared a holy war, a jihad against America operating from a hidden refuge in Afghanistan. For the past 10 years, the most well-equipped intelligence agencies on the planet have hunted bin Laden, but he has been elusive. There have been numerous alleged sightings of the man, all of which have led nowhere. Tonight will be different. The CIA has confirmed that Osama bin Laden, his children, his many wives, have occupied the Abbottabad compound since 2005. Interrogation of al-Qaeda detainees at the U.S.-run Guantanamo Bay prison in Cuba revealed the name of a bin Laden courier known as Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti, real name Ibrahim Saeed Ahmed. In 2007, Officials learned that this messenger was living in Abbottabad under the, an alias. Careful tracking of Ahmed's movements led the CIA to believe he might be sheltering bin Laden. U.S. intelligence officials sought to confirm this hunch by obtaining a blood sample from one of the many children whom satellite photos showed to be living in the compound. These same images revealed the first intriguing images of the pacer. Pakistani doctor Shaquille Afridi, considered the top physician in the nearby Khyber tribal regions, was recruited by the CIA to set up a vaccine clinic in Abbottabad. He had previously worked on several U.S.-funded vaccination programs in, in Pakistan and willingly agreed. Afridi was not told the name of the target. Unbeknownst to the doctor, any blood samples that he could that could be acquired would be compared with DNA known to belong to bin Laden to confirm a match. The operation was successful. In a footnote, Dr. Afridi was arrested by Pakistani authorities on May 23, 2011. He's currently serving a 23-year sentence in a 
Punjab prison, Presidents Obama, Trump, and Biden have been unable to secure his release. After the verification of bin Laden's location, the American military and the CIA developed Operation Neptune Spear. Several different tactics were discussed, including a stealth bomber dropping munitions on the compound or a drone-fired missile. But none of those actions would confirm the truth about whether Osama bin Laden was dead or alive, so the decision was made to send in the SEAL teams to do the work. But the strategy is a high-risk gamble. The SEALs have all volunteered to travel to Pakistan without permission from its government, knowing full well that a Pakistani military headquarters is just two miles from the compound. Should they be captured alive, each SEAL is guaranteed hours of the most heinous torture before being executed, most likely by beheading in a dank jail cell. Thus, the taut time on target must be short as possible. There are so many things that can go wrong. The twin-engine UH-60 carries 1,200 pounds of fuel in each of its two tanks. That's enough gas for 90 minutes of flying. In another 1,200-pound auxiliary tank, Heavy stealth technology and the combined weight of the men and these aircraft are at the very end of their technical flying ability. Simply put, they might not have enough gas to get home. And getting home in this case means flying back into Afghanistan over the rugged Hindu Kush, some of the most difficult terrain on earth. But for pilots and SEALs alike, many years of training have been preparation for a scenario just like this neutralizing a sworn enemy who has just who has killed not just in America but all over the globe for two decades Osama bin Laden is the most important target in the world three minutes until the drop the pilots close in rapidly the sound of their rotors will be audible to those in the compound when the helicopters are just two minutes out the residence has been heavily surveilled, but even after months of planning, questions remain. Nobody knows if the walls or rooftops are booby-trapped, whether an underground escape tunnel will allow the occupants to flee into the night, or how quickly the nearby Pakistani military will respond to the incursion. But already there's good news. No activity has been sighted anywhere in the area, a sign that the American pilots have successfully flown beneath the radar. Now they need to maintain that cloak of invisibility. Darkness helps. Power outages are common in this Pakistani garrison town, and on this hot night, Abbottabad is bathed in total darkness. All light in both helicopters is suppressed. The SEALs make last-minute personal equipment checks. The assault is about to begin. The code name of the target? Geronimo. Osama bin Laden is asleep with his fourth wife, Amal, at his side. There are bars and curtains with yellow flowers on his windows. Barbed wire rings the compound. Before going to bed at 11 p.m., the undisputed leader of the Al-Qaeda terrorist network ate dinner. Bin Laden prefers bread, dates, and honey. He rarely eats meat. The terrorist also does not use utensils, preferring to eat with his right hand in the manner of the Prophet Muhammad. Bin Laden's two-year-old son, Hussein, also sleeps in the room. No one pays attention to the power outage. These occurrences are so frequent that they're no longer a cause for concern. The terrorist, his wife, and his child prayed together before bed. Osama bin Laden sleeps just two or three hours a night. He's an anxious man, often lying awake in the darkness, waiting for morning to come or taking sleeping pills when he cannot calm himself. But tonight is restful. So while her husband slumbers, it is Amal who hears the rotors of approaching helicopters. Mr. President tells an aide, an aide tells Barack Obama, this is going to take a while. You might not want to sit here and watch the whole thing unfold. President Obama's in the basement of the White House, West Wing. In the Intelligence Command post known as the Situation Room, the time is shortly before 4 p.m. A large television screen airs a live feed of the mission in Pakistan transmitted from drones capable of circling as high as 50,000 feet. The unmanned aircraft is invisible to the naked eye and is capable of remaining over a target for many hours at a time. Can you imagine a, a surveillance camera 50,000 feet up in the air and watching it take place? 
Operation Neptune Spear combines the effort of the civilian CIA and Military Joint Special Operations Command, JSOC. So a similar viewing is taking place on a seventh floor conference room at, at Central Intelligence Agency headquarters in Langley, Virginia, watched by Agency Director Leon Panetta, who has dedicated almost a year to this risky venture. Panetta is in direct contact with Mission Commander Admiral William McRaven at the SEALs departure base in Halalabad. But seeing the President depart causes others to follow him into the office of a military advisor. The room's cramped, but that does not stop people from crowding into it, much to Obama's dismay. Barack Obama wears a white golf shirt and blue windbreaker bearing the presidential emblem. Though knowing full well the operation would proceed tonight, he intentionally played golf earlier to avoid a departure from his normal Sunday routine. Being president means having your every moment and word scrutinized. Obama did not want to hint toward tonight's operation in any way. A long conference table covered with open laptops and various drinks filled with the center of the small space. Vice President Joe Biden is openly nervous. He and Defense Secretary Robert Gates, who is also present, are ambivalent about the mission. Both men have been asking many questions about its viability, still remembering the 1980 American debacle in the Iranian desert when eight U.S. servicemen were killed and six aircraft destroyed after a botched effort to res rescue American hostages. That incident damaged the presidency of Jimmy Carter beyond repair. There was also Somalia in 1993 where a Black Hawk helicopter was shot down, resulting in the deaths of 18 Americans. That incident still is vividly remembered by the public because of a best-selling book and a subsequent Hollywood movie. Failure tonight would be a disaster far worse than Iran or Somalia, and President Obama would take much of the heat. Wearing a brown blazer, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton enters the room and takes a seat next to Secretary Gates. Antony Blinken, destined one day to become future President Joe Biden's Secretary of State, stands in the doorway. There is very little talking. The air is thick with tension. Everything is going according to plan. Until it doesn't. Chalk 1 hovers over the Waziristan Palace. Seals poised to fast rope out the open doors. Suddenly, the 18-foot high stone compound walls and hot air contribute to a dangerous condition known as vortex ring state, which prevents the helicopter rotors from producing lift. Suddenly, the tail of the 60 bounces atop the compound wall. Lack of lift pitches the helicopter forward and down toward the ground. The tail wheel acts as a pivot point, forcing the Black Hawk to tilt sharply to the right. The main rotor digs hard into the loose soil of the vegetable garden. Pilot and co-pilot strain against their seat belts, helmets and harnesses holding them fast into their cockpit seats. In the cabin behind, the unbelted seals pitch forward, falling onto one another. They struggle to remain inside the helicopter. Slipping out the open doors into a spinning blade would be a horrific way to die. Events unfold quickly. The pilots immediately shut down the Black Hawk's two engines. Seals, many slightly injured, scramble to the exit, Guns at the ready, the crash has been anything but silent, and the invaders prepare for incoming fire from the compound. Outside, Chalk 2 lands in a field but takes off inst the instant the seals and Cairo jump out. The dogs immediately left off his leash to search for threats. He's been in combat before and knows the difference between a helpless, helpless infant and a lethal terrorist. Smart dog, isn't he? The original task of these operators was perimeter defense, but now they move to blow the walls and enter the compound, not knowing the fate of their comrades in the crashed helicopter. The invading SEALs now see bin Laden's safe house for the first time. They have practiced on a life-sized version at a secret location in North Carolina, but this is the real thing. We opened the doors and I looked out, SEAL operator Robert O'Neill will remember. Seeing the high walls and knowing what must be done to complete this mission successfully, O'Neill thought, this is some serious Navy SEAL shit we're going to do. Osama bin Laden is now awake. A loud, bright explosion shakes the house as he crouches on the bedroom floor. The sound of the crashing helicopter cuts through the night with a noise so loud that a witness will later call it a noise of magnitude I have never heard before. 
baby Hussein cries. Amal tries to turn on a light, forgetting about the power outage. No, bin Laden commands, opening the bedroom door. He screams down the stairs to his son Khalid. Come up! Americans are coming, yells Khalid, running up the stairs in white pajamas, clutching a loaded AK-47 automatic rifle. The crying voices of the many children in the three-story structure echo up and down the stairwell. Outside, a new explosion rings through the night as seals breach the perimeter wall on the north side of the compound. Two bodyguards, brothers Ibrahim Saeed Ahmed and Abrar Ahmed, have sworn loyalty to bin Laden and stand ready to fight. The men are Pakistanis who oversaw the construction of the compound but have long feared that a night like this might come. Several times they suggested that bin Laden and his extended brood relocate. After a time, the terrorists reluctantly agreed but asked for postponement of the departure until September 2011, the 10th anniversary of the terror attack on America. Now, five minutes into the SEAL landings, as explosions destroy the big metal doors guarding the compound entrances, Osama bin Laden regrets his decision. Four months away, he would have moved out. It appears that we have a helicopter down in the animal pen, Admiral McRaven says from Afghanistan over the live video feed. Backup helicopter on the way. In fact, McRaven ordered one Chinook to fly to the compound just moments ago. At CIA headquarters in Virginia, Director Panetta watches the crash of Chalk 1 with rising fear. A multi-million dollar helicopter crashes and it's Black Hawk down all over again. Maybe. At the White House, President Obama will recall feeling a, an electric kind of fear. A disaster real played in my head, he said. The authors reviewed the eyewitnesses' testimony from people inside the compound who were not killed. This account is taken directly from their transcripts. The mood in the small conference room is grim. More than a dozen of America's top leaders fill the space, anxiously watching the screen. Mr. Obama sits off to the side in a small chair, leaning forward, eyes riveted. Secretary Clinton presses one hand to her face, covering her mouth. The video feed is a series of monochromatic images. 24 seals are now on the ground with the most inside the compound. Explosions and gunshots can be heard clearly as the seals apply breaching charges to blast doorways, even as the trapped occupants open fire with AK-47s. The seal weapons are suppressed, making very little noise when they fire, so all audible gunshots are from bin Laden's security team, which now includes 23-year-old Khalid. The team from Chalk One can be seen entering the main house. Others make their way to a small annex known by the code symbol C1 on the seal's laminated maps of the compound secured in their pants pockets. Suddenly, as the team is about to enter the building, rounds from an AK-47 assault weapon rattle above their heads, glass shatters falling onto the crouched Americans. Returning fire, the seals shoot into the darkness, but there's no response. The firing stops. A woman yells to them, then slowly steps into their line of sight. She's holding a baby. He's dead, the woman says to the fighters. The SEALs never take their fingers off the trigger, fearing that she may be wearing a suicide vest. Slowly, the, the invaders follow the wife of Ibrahim Saeed Ahmed into a bedroom. There, her husband, the courier for bin Laden, who unknowingly led the CIA to this location, lies in the doorway. The floor is thick with his blood and the seals will later remember the room smelling of heating oil. The demise of Saeed Ahmed is not seen by those watching in Washington, Virginia, and Afghanistan. The drone cannot show the inside of the buildings, so for 20 long minutes, the feed from space remains silent. We're going to take a break. We'll be back 15 minutes. <laughs>
for church on the word audible books. Okay. <laughs> now we'll... we'll <clears throat> All right, let's back back up and come back into what's happening. Now, where are they at? Does everybody know? Twenty-four seals are inside and outside the compound. They're all over it like bees on a hive. The video feed is a series of monochromatic images. Twenty-four seals are now on the ground, with most inside the compound. Explosions and gunshots can be heard clearly as the seals apply breaching charges to blast doorways. Even as the trapped occupants open fire with AK-47s, the seal weapons are suppressed, making very little noise when they fire. So all audible gunshots are from bin Laden's security team, which now includes 23-year-old Khalid. The team from Chalk 1 can be seen entering the main house. Others make their way to a small annex known as by the code symbol C1 on the SEAL's laminated maps of the compound secured in their pants pockets. Suddenly, as the team is about to enter the building, rounds from an AK-47 assault rifle rattle above their heads, Glass shatters falling onto the crouched Americans. Returning fire, the seals shoot into the darkness. There's no response. The firing stops. A woman yells to them, then slowly steps into their sight line. She's holding a baby. <clears throat> He's dead, the woman says to the fighters. The seals never take their fingers off the trigger, fearing that she may be wearing a suicide vest. Slowly, the invaders follow the wife of Ibrahim Saeed Ahmed into a bedroom. There, her husband, the courier for bin Laden, who unknowingly led the CIA to this location, lies in the doorway. The floor is thick with his blood, and the seals will later remember the room smelling of heating oil. The demise of Saeed Ahmed is not seen by those watching in Washington, Virginia, and Afghanistan. The drone video cannot show the inside of the building, so... For 20 long minutes, the feed from space remains silent. <clears throat> Cautiously, the SEALs leave Building C-1 and cross the compound to a much larger complex mission planners have labeled A-1, the main house. The light, the night, is far from silent. Children continue to cry. Women are shrieking. A three-man team enters a long hallway with two doors on each side. As the SEALs creep forward, one inhabitant of the residence cautiously leans his head out of the first door on the left. The seal walking point immediately fires a single shot. Unsure if the target is hit, the team moves quickly into the room. Abrar Ahmed lies wounded on the floor, an AK-47 nearby. Suddenly, the bodyguard's wife jumps forward in the darkness trying to prevent the seals from getting to her husband. The Americans have been warned that women in the compound might be armed and that some might even be wearing explosives. The invaders take no chances opening fire. Abrar and his wife, Bushra, both die instantly. It is known that four men occupy the compound. Two are now dead. That leaves Khalid bin Laden and his father directly upstairs from where the seals now stand. <clears throat> In his third floor bedroom, Osama bin Laden prays. His family's gathered around. They want me, not you, the terrorist tells two of his wives who have run upstairs to be at his side. There is confusion as some refuse to leave and others have no idea where to go. Americans are in the courtyard and some seals have entered the main house. <clears throat> Carefully, six seals climb to the second floor floor using a narrow spiral staircase. The steps are tiled. Fighting here will be at close quarters. Every footfall or whining door hinge spells trouble. The seals see the image of a man standing on the stairwell leading to the third floor. He's seeking to conceal himself and does not present much of a target. Believing the individual might be bin Laden's son, the seal walks point softly Walking point softly calls out in Arabic, Khalid, come here. The younger bin Laden is confused. Cautiously, he peers out from his hiding spot. He's promptly shot in the chin, the bullet slicing through his brain before exiting the back of his skull. 
Khalid bin Laden falls backward onto the stairs. The seals continue their advance, stepping around Khalid, whose white shirt is drenched in his blood. His loaded AK-47 is propped against a wall, never fired. At this point, three of the four males occupying the compound have been eliminated. Only Geronimo remains. Two rooms stand at the top of the stairs. A curtain conceals the entrance to one. A man with a long beard pokes his head out. He thinks he's invisible in the darkness. The seals immediately open fire. The man withdraws back into the bedroom, but his AK-47 pokes out around the door jamb. <clears throat> Two seals press their advantage, bounding up the stairs and throwing back the curtain. Two young girls stand in the room. One seal tackles them, fearing they are wearing bombs. Terrified, they cry out, <clears throat> having never been touched by a man not of their own family. Sheik, one yells toward the man with the beard. <clears throat> now comes the standoff. One seal remains staring into the eyes of Osama bin Laden, who is standing at the foot of the bed. The terrorist beard is his most prominent feature. His hair is cut short. Amal stands in front of him. Bin Laden keeps his hands on her shoulders, using the mother of his young child who now sits sobbing just a few feet away as a human shield. Amal is bleeding from one leg, having taken one of the bullets fired up the stairwell. Osama bin Laden has had <clears throat> years to prepare for this moment. There's a chance he's wearing a suicide vest <clears throat> or perhaps concealing a gun or a knife. Using his wife's torso to prevent the intruders from seeing these weapons, Bin Laden is a man who hates Americans and would have no compunction about blowing himself up to take more American lives in his final act. The seal weighs all these realities. So it is that Senior Chief Petty Officer Robert O'Neill raises his weapon high to accommodate Bin Laden's height. The barrel is aimed at the spot just over Amal's shoulder. The seal does not hesitate. The first bullet cuts a furrow through the top of Bin Laden's skull. The second shot is insurance. So is the third. The terrorist's tongue hangs from his mouth as his body goes limp. His head is blown apart. Other seals enter the room, having made their way to the top of the stairs. One by one, they fire into the corpse. Payback for those who died on 9-11. The message is radioed back to Halalabad and then relayed to Langley and the White House. The acronym for Enemy Killed in Action, Rockets Halfway Around the World. We heard McRaven's and Leon's voices almost simultaneously utter the words we've been waiting to hear. President Obama will write, Geronimo, E-K-I-A. <clears throat> there is no celebration. Not yet. Osama bin Laden's corpse is placed in an olive drab body bag. The SEALs carry him to the waiting helicopter outside the compound walls. Inside, the buildings are ransacked for intelligence. Computer hard drives, laptops, thumb drives, documents, and all cell phones are seized. This treasure trove of information is the most captured in a single recent raid. Vacuum-sealed piles of opium are discovered beneath bin Laden's bed, the source of his income in the many years since his bank accounts were frozen. Meanwhile, the explosions have attracted a crowd. <clears throat> Cairo is kept on his leash as an interpreter warns away curious citizens arriving to see the source of the noise. Dogs are considered devilish and filthy in Muslim culture, and the mere presence of a snarling Cairo is enough to deter the crowd. A Chinook arrives to ferry out operators and captured intelligence. Bin Laden's wives and children will be left behind. In a side note, a footnote, it says, Amal, along with the other wives and children of Osama bin Laden living in the compound at the time of the SEAL mission, were deported to Saudi Arabia after spending a year in a Pakistani detention facility. They remain there to this day. Amal waited until 2017 to reveal her side of the story about the events of the night of the SEAL raid. <clears throat> The dead terrorist has two emergency phone numbers and 500 euros sewn into the fabric of his underwear. Space inside the helicopter carrying Osama bin Laden is so cramped 
that one seal has no choice but to sit atop the body for the flight back to Halalabad. Photos are taken of bin Laden's face as the first step in authenticating the terrorist identity. Inside the compound, the downed UH-60 is blown up to prevent its technology from falling into the hands of the Pakistanis. The bright light and noise from the detonation <clears throat> is so powerful that it can be heard and seen for miles around. A Pakistani military response is surely imminent. Time to go. The mission is now almost over. But there's one more danger to overcome. The two U.S. helicopters have a 90-minute flight back to Afghanistan. A single Pakistani fighter jet could shoot the helicopters from the sky. The SEALs are apprehensive. The journey is especially long. At 5.41 p.m. Eastern Time, cheers go up in Washington, D.C., this is the moment when both SEAL teams cross safely into Afghanistan. Nine minutes later, they touch down safely at Halalabad Air Base. U.S. intelligence will later learn that Pakistani authorities had turned off their radar on this hot Sunday night and that even if there had been advance warning, their fighter pilots were unwilling to fly in the dark. <clears throat> Let's see him, Admiral McRaven says as the body bag is removed from UH-60. The corpse is dropped onto the cement hangar floor. CIA analysts hastily begin conducting DNA tests to confirm the identity of the body. The sample matches those recently taken from family members. In order to calculate bin Laden's height, one very tall seal is ordered to lie down on the floor next to the terrorist's body. In a footnote, it says, in a subsequent conversation, President Obama playfully mocked Admiral McRaven for losing a multi-million dollar helicopter during the raid, but not having the foresight to purchase a one dollar tape measure. <laughs> At 11.35 p.m. Eastern, President Barack Obama addresses the nation. In his hastily written speech, he informs the world that the long hunt for Osama bin Laden is over. CIA Director Panetta, who has driven to the White House to share the triumph with the President, leaves shortly after the speech. He's stunned to see crowds lining the sidewalk cheering this moment of national victory. USA! 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 They chant. Panetta will call it one of the best moments of his life. In Afghanistan, the Navy SEALs and their Army pilots are reveling in the mission's success, laughing and rehashing the action moment by moment, just a few feet from the body of Osama bin Laden. The sense of relief is palpable with thoughts of the many things that could have gone wrong after the crash of Chalk 1 in everyone's heads. This is also a sad moment for Will Chesney, Cairo's handler, who must soon say goodbye to the veteran dog after three years working together. Cairo often sleeps in Chesney's bed and has been his constant companion through that time. In a footnote, it says Cairo was six years old at the time. The military retires dogs at seven. A little more than a year after the mission, Will Chesney adopted the 70-pound Cairo, and the two remained together until Cairo's death from cancer in 2015. <laughs> but the night's not over. Shortly after landing in Halalabad, the SEALs, Cairo, their harvest of intelligence data, and the body of Osama bin Laden board a C-130 Hercules cargo plane for the flight to Afghanistan's Bagram Air Base, 150 miles away. There, they watch President Obama's speech on a big screen television, clean their weapons, store their gear, and grab a bite. The feeling of elation does not subside. The SEALs will soon continue to Washington, there to meet the President. Each will receive a silver star for bravery. You see how tough that was, and they got a silver star? They didn't get the Presidential Medal of Honor. My brother-in-law, Jerry Murphy, owns the same silver star. I ought to tell you something about him. Rather than bury bin Laden on land and have his grave become a shrine for terrorists everywhere, the team will dispatch the corpse at sea where there's no chance of his final resting place will ever be located. In strict accordance with Islamic law, Bin Laden is buried within 24 hours of his death. He's washed, shrouded in white cloth. There's no coffin. A U.S. Navy sailor of the Muslim faith witnesses the cleaning and wrapping of the body. 
And so it is that Osama bin Laden, wrapped tightly in the cloth, is placed inside a body bag with 300 pounds of iron chains. The bag, resting on a flat board, is tipped over the side of the USS Carl Benson, sliding into the depths of the Arabian Sea. There are some eyewitnesses who suggest the body bag holding bin Laden might have been sliced open to allow creatures of the deep easier access to his remains, but that is not confirmed. <clears throat> what is confirmed is that the heinous mastermind of 9-11 has finally received justice. But as one killer leaves the stage, many others are anxious to take his place. There will be no shortage of terror killers in the years to come. I'll quote a well-known quote. Freedom is not free. <clears throat> Freedom comes at a high price. We pay for it in young boys and girls and souls. We pay for it in blood. Our tax dollars pay for hours and hours of hard training and only the finest surface to the top. Very, very, very small percentage of SEAL trainees make it. Some die in training. It's so intense. But that's why we're here tonight, for peace. Because it's not just the enemies that hate freedom. It's demonic activity that hates Christianity from which that Christianity boils like a cauldron out of this nation to other nations of the world. It's much more about spiritual warfare than we know about. But to back that and have spiritual warfare, it's back. You have to, you deal with <clears throat> the fact that there's just a lot of physical warfare that has to take place. But not one of those boys were scratched. All 24, in and out, got it done. They say that when they, that uh, helicopter had to be dispatched, had to be destroyed, they had a... Um, on board an explosive that would burn it so it would the, the, the light would be so bright it would put your eyes out when it exploded. <clears throat> it was like a, a hot uh, welding torch that you, you know you can if you look at a welding torch it'll burn your eyes. That thing was so big, hundreds of times bigger than a, a welding light and it would have blinded anybody that watched it. But that, that helicopter had to be incinerated. When they would do that to incinerate that helicopter so that its technology would not be handed over to the Pakistanis, it makes you wonder why we left so many billions of dollars worth of equipment in Afghanistan when we extracted from the... Why did we do that? <clears throat> so that's the prologue to Killing the Killers, a book by Bill O'Reilly, The Secret War Against Terrorism. I highly suggest that you get the book. It's one of a series of 13 books, killing, the Killing Series books. I'd like to read to you, if you don't mind me being a, having reading time in elementary school, like we used to have, in, I'd like to read Killing Jesus to you. It's not a spiritual book, it's a history. So maybe we'll look at that. But <clears throat> They're enjoyable to read. They're, 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 they never get boring. They never drag. And... Uh, the, from what I understand, that the rule of thumb is before anything can be put into any of Bill O'Reilly's Killing Series books, the accuracy of it had to be confirmed by five different uh, infallible proofs before it would be put in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, there is uh, killing Jesus, there's killing Reagan, there's killing Kennedy, killing uh, Lincoln was a good one. There was uh, killing uh, uh, the rising sun. Uh, there's killing Patton. Uh, uh, just the latest one that came out, I've got mailed to me, is killing the witches, 
was the, the, the Salem witch trials, and uh, they say it's fascinating. Um, but I would suggest you get all 13 books and put them in your library and, and read them. They're accurate history, and I'll tell you this. I think we don't say enough about history. I'm right now teaching my teenagers and my kids, and Lynn and Harold are helping me. We're going to teach them the Constitution of the United States, the documents of America, our voting privileges. We're going to teach them all about how that, how, why that's godly, and to teach the kids that, uh, that righteousness exalts a nation, and uh, teach the, we're teaching the kids that um, to pray for their leaders and, and protect freedom. So that's our training for this year and um, during this election year. You saw that um, uh, Ron DeSantis dropped out of the race today. Vivek Ramaswamy dropped out last week. It's just him and Nikki Haley. So we'll see what happens. <clears throat> we haven't gotten to New Hampshire yet, and already the field is... You remember the year that we had 17 total, 16 others besides Trump that ran? And he, he jumped out front, and so in the first debate, the, the front runner always gets front stage center, and everybody else, according to their percentages, each side of him. And when he said some things that were just over the top, um, he was, I remember Trump mouthing it, Jeb Bush, and they took offense to it. <clears throat> and, uh, and in the second debate, Jeb Bush was standing further away because he dropped in the, in the polls, and he said... Uh, you're not going to be able to, to insult your way to the White House, Donald. He said, well, Jeb, low energy Jeb. He said, he said, I see you're further away than you. He said, a few more days, you're going to drop off the other side of the stage. And he's just, he just cruel. My God. But see, he believes in going after his opponents with everything. And, and he mowed down all... So, yeah, he, he endorsed him. How do you not endorse him? Um, mowed down all 17. Um, I want to see if I still have it. I want to read this to you, and then we'll go here tonight. Did you enjoy the, the um, being read to tonight? Yes. Were you able to follow along? Could you see? Yes. Did, did, your, did your mind paint the, the theater, the picture? That was what I wanted to do. Let's see if I still have this. Um. <clears throat> in my notes. Let me go to the other end and back up. Oh, here it is. Whether you love or hate him, Trump's ascendancy to the presidency, to the presidency was a once-in-a-century miracle. He was literally a man without a party, yet beat 16 primary competitors and an opponent whose victory was her manifest destiny. It was a political feat, unequaled in history. He's going to win again, too. Whether you like him or don't, he's going to win. And it's really not, it's really not a matter of Democrat and Republican. And it's really not a matter of ideology, sexism, or anything like that. It's really not a matter of Trump. It's a matter of the United States, the people of the United States of America are rising up. The New Hampshire, uh, the, the rallies leading up to New Hampshire, you cannot get to them for people cheering. It's the, it is the rising up of the people. It would... Before the Civil War broke out, because it broke out right after the beginning of Abraham Lincoln's first administration. So before it broke out, the nation was, they were anticipating war. And <clears throat> President Lincoln said, this nation, in his inaugural address now, in his address, he said, this nation and its institutions belong to the people that, in, that inhabit it. He said, when those people begin to be disgruntled with that nation, with that government. They can exercise their constitutional right of amending it and replacing it, or they can exercise their revolutionary right to dismember and overthrow it. Now, he said that. But now he swore in an oath 
to protect this republic from all enemies, foreign and domestic, which is why he had to stand and know he was taking up arms against fellow Americans. But he had enemies of the republic for good reason, but still enemies of the republic. And um, <clears throat> it was Thomas Jefferson that said that the, the, the tree of liberty from time to time must be watered with the blood of tyrants and patriots. Let's pray that this great republic and the tree of liberty that has been established by this great republic does not need a watering. Pray that it does not need, that see from time, even the girl that was killed in the, in the uh, Capitol riot on January 6th and the other people that died is a, it was a birth pangs of what could possibly come. See, America knew that the, the, the election had been stolen. They knew it. That's why a million people showed up. And there wasn't one person on that ground that day in Washington that was, that was not told and guarantee you they were threatened. Do not turn that camera on this crowd. You're being inviting a riot, inciting. So they kept it right on Trump. But there were a million people there that day. A million people. What will we do when they press us hard enough for 20 million to show up? They'll mow down the White House, the, the, the Capitol and everything else. Eat it like a bunch of eating insects and leave it just a shell. Pray that does not happen. Pray that that does not happen. <clears throat> but at the same time, you need to pray that those that would try to create a constitutional crisis and steal an election, somebody's head needs to roll and send a message that if you, create, if you commit a treasonous act, You'll be, you'll be met with what our, our laws require, a retribution in like manner. Treason is punishable by death. <clears throat> this will be an ugly year. You're going to hear the worst. I mean, those that are holding on to power will do anything to hold on to it, lie about anything. They'll pull their gloves off and let you know it's them. I'm telling you, we're... We, we, we'll, we will have never seen, I predict to you by November, the absolute onslaught of lies and filth and mud, more than mud slinging. I'm talking about it's vermin slinging at each other. It's going to be the most un, it's going to be the most hideous thing you've ever seen in your life. <clears throat> but we can pray and it curb it. Our prayers will be heard. And this, like. Lincoln said, he said, we're now engaged in a battle testing whether this republic or any nation so conceived can long endure. He said, and that this nation of the people, by the people, and for the people should not perish from off the face of the earth. It's a nation of laws. This is what a republic is. We're not a democracy by itself. A democracy says that the majority rules. So if everybody in here agreed, say three, what is it? Let's say ten of us in here and say nine of us or seven of us agree that one of us needs to die, then well, that's okay. We, we'll kill the one because seven of them said so. See, that's a democracy. But a republic is not so. A republic has a document with established laws, and the people whether they like or not, have to follow those laws. But if you don't enforce the laws that you put on the books, then you undermine and sabotage the very republic that you gave birth to in the first place, which is why we have to remain a constitutional republic. Follow our Constitution to the letter. I'm going to teach our young people the Constitution within the framework of their ability to understand it, and they're not going to hear the details. <clears throat> I don't want them to quote it. <clears throat> but I do want them to understand the three branches of the government, the president, the uh, how the Congress works and how the judicial system works. Judicial system 
established for right and wrong, isn't it? But then they say there's a separation of church and state. Okay, we're not going to establish a church, but we're not going to. We're also going to not hinder the free exercise thereof. Okay, but while I'm not, I'm I'm a I'm a proponent of separation of church and state, even though that's not written in the Constitution. But I'm also a proponent of the fact that if you can legislate unrighteousness, then you should be able to legislate righteousness. And you bet they have legislated unrighteousness. And they did it through the court system, five to four. Five people told you against four people. Five people told 300 million Americans what our moral code is. So it's, 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 it's not necessarily a flawed system, but it's not a perfect system. The reason it's not is because it's not a theocracy. We're not going to have that until Jesus returns. We can trust him. Did you learn something tonight? <clears throat> you can bet if Osama bin Laden had not been <clears throat> eliminated, he would have done some more. There was no reason for him to have done what he did in 9-11. Bill Clinton had a chance to get rid of him and didn't. You see why it's so important that we get the right man in the White House? And you, when you read Killing the Killers, you'll also read about, um, what's his name, uh, Khalid al-Baghdadi. Remember him? You remember General Soleimani? Both of those were eliminated by Trump. And I'm telling you, to find out just how he was eliminated by Trump, Soleimani will blow you away when you read this book. I mean, it'll, it'll wipe you out. <clears throat> and he said the reason that he wrote the book is that many of the uh, top brass in the, in the government, knowing how the, the uh, uh, in the military, knowing how Bill O'Reilly writes and how accurate and truthful he is, came to him to tell the story. He said, so I did. you want to read it. Killing the Killers is very, very Good. Be back tomorrow night. <clears throat> I love y'all. 7.54, we'll go a little bit early. See you tomorrow night, 6 o'clock.